hello there. Thank you for joining me for the latest edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook, and we have a very busy show for you this week. Later on in the program, I'll sit down with Richmond MLA Trevor Boudreau to talk about the past legislature session that took place this fall at Province House, Trevor Boudreau's first as an MLA, and look ahead to some issues that could dominate the proceedings for the MLAs and their constituents in the coming year. Later on, we'll visit the Fall Awards Banquet for the Strait Area Chamber of Commerce and get a snapshot of the Strait Area business community as it prepares for the second Christmas shopping season taking place during the COVID-19 pandemic. But we begin with two different Richmond County communities that were linked by a common bond this past Tuesday. Specifically, they both have long-term care facilities and they both have long-term care facility workers that are concerned about their working conditions and those of their colleagues across the province. CUPE declared a Provincial Day of Action on Tuesday, November the 30th to help bring awareness to the struggles facing long-term care workers, not just in Richmond County, but all over Nova Scotia. So let's visit the communities of St. Peter's and First Arishat as we take a look at what the local long-term care facility workers are concerned about and what they'd like to see the provincial government do. A cold, windy Tuesday morning in Arishat didn't stop these members of CUPE Local 5032 from hitting the bricks just outside their workplace of St. Anne's Community and Nursing Care Centre. And at the same time in St. Peter's, even a mixture of rain, wet snow and wind didn't dampen the enthusiasm of these members of CUPE Local 1782 protesting not far from their workplace of the Richmond Villa. They're all outside on this Tuesday for the same reason. Between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. on the last day of November, the Canadian Union of Public Employees encouraged a province-wide day of action to draw attention to the working conditions in long-term care facilities. Wages are part of the issues faced by local long-term care representatives. QP officials are seeking a 10% wage increase for their members working in long-term care facilities across Nova Scotia. At the same time, union local representatives suggest that the current wage structure is preventing many young people from taking up training to become continuing care assistants, licensed practical nurses, and others so badly needed in long-term care facilities at this moment. We don't have high wages, so it makes it difficult for to recruit people to come in here with, you know, when you're not even making $19 an hour, it's, you know, you can go work anywhere else and probably make that and not even work half as hard. People aren't, don't seem to be taking the courses, course numbers are down, CCAs there used to be 20 to 30, 20 to 30 people in a class and this year there's 10. So I mean the wages aren't sufficient so people just don't want to do the job for what, it's a lot of work for what they're getting paid. There's no incentives to have people come to work, um, you know they could be offering better wage packages, they could be offered better benefits something out there help you know even supporting them to go to school like there's people that would love to take the course but just don't have the funding to take it right as a result of this difficulty in bolstering the long-term care facility employee roster not just locally but across the province many of the current workers at places like the richmond villa and saint anne center are feeling burnout after dealing with long shifts and little hope of getting a rest. There's been no vacation granted all summer due to staffing shortages. People are getting burnt out. They're working double shifts. We're tired. We're tired. People need, we need support. We need the government to step up and and uh, do what they say they're going to do and help fix the system. We're not just doing it for us. We're doing it for our residents that we love and we take care of every day. They deserve more care. They're here. They need their dignity. CUPE representatives that spoke to Telil on this day of action warned that this situation has been going on well before the COVID-19 pandemic swept through. And as a result, they're calling on the provincial government to make good on their plans to fix health care and to remember that long-term care is an integral part of Nova Scotia's overall health care strategy. We're part of health care too, so when... The Premier went around to speak to the health care. They did not include long-term care, and long-term care was not invited to any of their sessions. Um, so we're also looking for legislation of 4.1 hours per care per residence. Right now, we're sitting at um, six to seven residents per one CCA. Four to one is what we're looking for for a ratio, yeah. Yeah, so, so our seniors can get the proper care that they need. 
And according to CUPE representatives in both St. Peter's and Arishat, Richmond County residents reacted positively and supportively to the of action on Tuesday. Really good. We got a lot of people stopping and, you know, giving us thumbs up and it's really good. Now, if you looked carefully as you were driving by these QP protests, you might have seen a couple of familiar elected faces. For instance, here in St. Peter's on Grenville Street, that's Richmond County Warden and District 4 Councillor Amanda Mumbercat. Over in Arishat, Richmond MLA Trevor Boudreau was among those welcoming the protesters from St. Anne's Community and Nursing Care Centre. We'll be speaking to MLA Trevor Boudreau about this a little later on in the show. And you might have seen somebody handing out flyers to motorists on behalf of the QP protesters in Arishat. That's District 1 Richmond County Councillor Sean Sampson. Yeah, when I was uh, asked to... to uh to attend here today and, and, and show my support. Uh, it was a no-brainer for me and it was an honor for me to be here with all these fine folks. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad it worked out. Everybody that I was passing out flyers to were like, yeah, we're, we're, we're with them, we're on their side. Uh, hopefully they, they, they get what they're looking for and they get more support and more wages. Uh, and uh, yeah, so everybody was very supportive and it was good to see for sure. This has been going on for, for years now and it's been a problem. I mean, uh, with the province, with the country, when it comes to our seniors and long-term care, uh, this is just not uh, something that just happened overnight. And I don't think it's gonna be something that's gonna get fixed overnight. Uh, but again, as I said in the past, uh, these people in these residents here at St. Anne Center and Richmond Villa and all the long-term cares in our province and, and here in Richmond County, uh, when it comes to us, uh, the people in these long-term care homes, uh, they're the people that paved the way for Richmond County. And uh, for us to, to take care of them, uh, we have to take care of our CCAs and our long-term care workers and all our health professionals, to be honest, right? So uh, it's an investment that has to be made and uh, hopefully uh, this will be a, a step in the right direction. So with support from their elected officials on this QP Day of Action, long-term care facility workers in Richmond County and across the province are hoping that words translate into action in the days, weeks, and months to come. In Arishat and St. Peter's for Tale Hill 24-7, I'm Adam Cook. Prior to being elected as the MLA for Richmond this past August, Trevor Boudreau had never been in Province House, but he spent a lot of time there this fall, and he sat down with me recently to talk a bit about his experiences and also some of the key issues that he and his Richmond constituents are concerned about at the present time. Here's that interview with MLA Trevor Boudreau right now. And we're very pleased to welcome back to Tell Hill 24-7 for the first time since his election as the MLA for Richmond back in August. Trevor Boudreau joins us today. Trevor, thanks for coming on board at the end of a busy session. How are you doing this afternoon? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Adam. We wanted to talk to you this time around about the fall past, basically, and the fall legislature session passed. Of course, uh, this was a special one because it was the first session for the new Tim Houston PC government, but also because you're a part of that PC caucus, and this is your first time in Province House. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about what these past couple of months have been like for you? Were there any surprises, any things that jumped out for you? Uh, what has it been like for you sitting in the Richmond seat? It's a fascinating place, and, and you know, a lot of people have been able to spend some time watching the legislature, uh, taking part in it uh, in different ways. I, I'd actually never been in the building before I stepped foot uh, in there um, for some training uh, before we actually got to uh, got to sit in our seats in the house. But it's a um, it's a it's a fascinating experience. It's um, you know there's a lot coming at us as as new MLAs and as uh, as a new party as uh, governing. And I'll tell you. Uh, there was a lot to learn really, really quick. I, I, I tell people it's not rocket science, but there's a, there's so much coming at you. You're just you're just trying to process it all and and understand it. So there were there were you know tense moments, anxiety kind of set in a little bit, saying like how how am I going to deal with this? And and you're taking on different roles, right? Some of them are new ministers, and even even our MLAs like um, you know Minister McMaster in Inverness. This was his first time. Uh, being a minister and so there's there's a lot to it and um, you know I think I think we came out of it uh, very well we were very pleased with the session certainly as a caucus and and uh, we're building a strong team and um, it's exciting to be part of that for sure. 
I was talking to Alan McMaster just a few days ago for our roundtable series, and he told me that it was a bit of culture shock for him, too, as well, after years of being on the opposition benches and then all of a sudden having to answer the opposition's questions instead of getting to ask them. But you've had some experience, of course, in municipal government serving as a councillor for the town of Port Hawkesbury. Do you think any of that prepared you for the atmosphere that greeted you uh, when you were sworn in and when you first took your seat at Province House? Oh, oh, absolutely. I think it was a great learning tool for, for, for me as a councillor moving in as an MLA. And we had to have a number of those in our caucus. So there were a number of us that utilized that um, skill set to help some of the other new MLAs and some of the other um, people involved to, to make sure that they feel comfortable with kind of how, how the legislation works, how, you know, it's, it's not necessarily Robert's rules of order, kind of like, um, like it was in town council, but, but the, you know, the processes are similar. The fascinating thing about the legislature is the the pomp and circumstance and the the traditions um, that that come with with it, and they're very set, right? This is the the oldest um, legislature, you know, uh, in in the province, and and it's been and, and even I think in or sorry, not province, the North America, yes. and um, and so so that's uh, you know that's something that you have to learn on the fly, and I don't know if anything prepares you for it till you till you get into it, so. Um, uh, quite a way to make your first steps into province house as you mentioned before did it help you at all to know that you had other people from the straight going in with you not just as MLAs but in that government caucus we talked about Alan McMaster Greg Morrow uh, for Guysboro Trackety and as well uh, Michelle Thompson from Antigonisha does it help to know that you saw some familiar faces from right in the straight area in that caucus with you as well Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's very comforting knowing you you've got each other's backs. And and early on in in the legislature, we we were you know not only in the house together, but we 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 chat afterwards. We kind of get a sense of where everybody, um, how everybody was feeling after the day, and kind of reorganize and reset. And Greg uh, Minister Morrow happens to be my seatmate, and uh, so oh, we sit really? next to each other. Yeah, in the legislature, and uh, I think Alan and and uh, or, you know Minister. McMaster and Minister Thompson, I think, are fairly close to each other. There may be one or two people in between them, but uh, but you know, you're in close quarters there. So you know, Greg can't uh, can't get to the washroom without having to move me out of the way. So uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, it's all good fun. But but uh, certainly, uh, we relied on each other quite a bit in terms of you know making sure we understood how um, how things were supposed to go. What is the atmosphere like in the caucus uh, with Tim Houston presiding? I mean, uh, you knew him well before the election was even called. Uh, you know, you two worked together following your nomination as the PC candidate for Richmond. So what is he like as a leader and as a premier presiding over a caucus and working with all of you there? Well, I can tell you, you know, getting to know Tim uh, over a year ago and, and, and like you said, um, being actively engaged with him for over a year, Tim's, the, uh, you know, the premier is the same person in caucus as he was, um, as he was on the campaign trail, and as he was when we'd sit and meet with business owners and community members in in, in Richmond. Um, he's a great leader. He's very compassionate, very empathetic. He really does want to make a difference, and um, and that, you know, his his influence is very contagious. So we're a very positive and upbeat caucus right now. Um, and we all all seem to be moving in the same direction, and um, and that's encouraging, right? So you're always going to have your discussions and your debates, and and certainly that happens uh, anywhere, and that's important. That's that's healthy, but but to know that um, that the premier has your back, and um, and and that everybody else is on board, and we're all working together, uh, you know, to 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 better the province. That's that's encouraging for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, a uh, few words or phrases escaped Premier Houston's mouth during the election campaign more often than fix health care. And uh, we know that that's a priority for this government going forward. We've seen already some moves that have taken place in that regard. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of physician recruitment, uh, Health Minister Michelle Thompson and uh, Dr. Kevin Orrell, a CEO and Deputy Minister for the uh, Health Care Professionals Recruitment Office, put out a wide range 
wide-ranging list of things that they want to do going forward uh, to try to make sure that things are done differently in terms of physician recruitment and retention. Uh, you've been involved in that for many years, obviously, uh, with the uh, Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health Committee. What are your thoughts on how this new campaign is going forward, and are there things you'd like to see added to it? It's a new position for Dr. Oral. I think he's very excited to be engaged in that position. It's a it's a passion of his. You can get that sense when you talk to him or when you when you you see him speak and and Minister Thompson uh, as well. This was part of her mandate letter was to to ensure that this was a priority and and from someone you know who was a counselor trying to, uh, to 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 be engaged in this capacity for a number of years now. This this is all encouraging, right? So really, what you know, Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health and and our and our local area, we we want to be engaged. We want uh, local decision makers, you know, a bit more decision making happening locally that. We're evaluating what our needs here are as a, as an as a region and and making sure that those are heard and you know I've had some correspondence with Dr. Oral and he's very open to that and um, you know the, the 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 people at Cape Breton South for recruiting for health and and the and even the hospital foundation who I've been speaking with uh, they're very excited about this opportunity and how they can be involved and engaged and and I think that's the most important part is um, you know allowing uh, communities to take take ownership in this and to make sure that they're a part of the solution because um, we're going to need all hands on deck. This is not a simple, easy fix. Um, you know, this uh, there. You know, we're struggling across Nova Scotia and across the country, really, for healthcare uh, uh, members. And and um, you know, it's not just physicians. We're we're short nurses. We're short CCAs, paramedics. You you name it, right? And so it's it's going to take all hands on deck. And and. The, the nice thing about it up, you know, in our neck of the woods is we're willing to step up and and um, that's encouraging for me because uh, I can do my advocacy role for the for the region because we have those people that want want to be engaged and want to be involved. And we spoke to Dr. Oral just last week here on Tail Hill 24-7. Uh, he spoke about a bit of a tour that he in the Office of Healthcare Recruitment is going to be doing, uh, stopping in various parts of the province. Uh, going to be stopping right here in the Strait as well, too. So we'll see that in a matter of days. Do you get the sense from him and from Minister Thompson that they recognize that the Strait is a, in a unique position in terms of their health care needs? And do you get the sense that you individually as an MS LA are getting listened to Trevor yeah you know it's that's one thing we're very fortunate to have uh Minister Thompson be a straight area MLA as well and she and I have oh it's it's at least once a day we're chatting on something and uh I think she respects the position that I've had and the positions that I you know I'm a healthcare provider my wife is a healthcare provider and and um as is Michelle as and and I'll tell you that um we have a great respect for our, each other's opinions and thoughts on this. And Dr. Oral has been more than gracious and is, like you said, going to be in the area and, and touring around the province. And they know that, um, you know, there are unique challenges to rural Nova Scotia and the Strait has um, some challenges of its own that are maybe a bit unique to here. Um, but, but certainly, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to be looking for what's, what's the best practices for those areas and how can they support them. And, you know, there's been some engagement already with um, the Department of Health and Wellness and with um, Nova Scotia Health and um, and our region. So uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm optimistic about about the the um, the challenges that we are going to face and how we're going to face them. So, you know, like it's 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 a process, though. Yes. And uh, I'm I'm the type that likes to see things move really, you know, uh, efficiently and effectively. And sometimes um, there's got to be a bit of patience with that too. And um, and I think that's something that I have to keep in mind when I'm encouraging and um, and challenging, you know, our minister and and also the you know the the staff that work under her. Minister Thompson, of course, in her past life uh, was the CEO for many years of the R.K. McDonald Nursing Home in Antigonish. And that brings me to our next topic here, Trevor, is long-term care. And part of the reason I wanted to bring this up is because you were present at an information awareness protest that took place in Arishat just a couple of days ago. Uh, you were one of a few different people that were at the protests in Arishat and St. Peter's in terms of provincial and municipal government representatives. Why do you think it was important for you to be there and to be able to hear out uh, the members of QP uh, that were concerned about uh, the current state of long-term care uh, here in the Strait and around Nova Scotia? What was your presence there all about? 
Well, look, you know, there's nobody that knows the healthcare system and our long-term care system better than the people who are on the ground. And I can tell you, these are passionate people, the, the, the CCAs and the LPNs and, 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 the, and the nursing staff that, that work in our long-term care facilities really do care. And they want to provide the best service to our seniors and to our, our clients that are in long-term care. And so what better way for me to, to be engaged than to, to speak directly to those people and, and also to just show that we, we care and that, and that our government hears them and that, uh, you know, we value their input and what they're saying. And, and we want to be partners with them in making sure that our long-term care facilities are successful in, in taking care of our most vulnerable. And so, you know, our, our, our government has already made some steps um, to show that long-term care uh, is a priority for us. Um, we, we've got a separate ministry and a different uh, a minister who uh, is, you know, is responsible for seniors in long-term care. We've made some announcements already with, uh, with another one coming in the next couple of weeks uh, uh, directly related to, you know, long-term care. And so, you know, we just want to make sure that, um, that our, you know, the CCA, uh, the CCAs in our, in our long-term care facilities and that work in home care as well, um, that they know that they're being heard, that we're, you know, th- this isn't a problem that just crept up in the last uh, two years. COVID has kind of shone a light on it, but this has been ongoing for a while. And, um, you know, there are steps that have to be taken to, um, to get us where we need to go. But, uh, but we're dedicated and, and um, as, a, as a government to, to seeing those happen. I want to stick quickly with the concept of the vulnerable in our society and in our region by shifting quickly over to affordable housing. Uh, your government also released its new housing plan this fall during the legislature session. Do you get the sense that this is going to make an impact both immediately and over the long term in the street, where I know we've seen in Richmond, Port Hawkesbury and the surrounding areas, there's been a real need for affordable housing development. So what's your feeling about how the new housing plan by your government can help out in this regard, Trevor? Well, look, I mean, it's, you know, any any type of program that um, that the government is, is is bringing forward is looking at how we can build better partnerships in our in our communities, in our regions, with developers, with uh, you know, and we have some tremendous people that are working on the ground here um, through the, you know, whether it's the the housing coalition, um, even Nova Scotia Housing, Cape Breton Housing. There are some really good people who really care. And I'll tell you, you know, I heard it at the doorsteps, um, but being being actually uh, an MLA in, a, in my constituency work, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of it. And, and certainly affordable housing is part of it. Um, you know, so is housing in general, right? We're talking about housing for physicians and nurses and and um, and trying to get professionals here too and so our government our government does certainly hear the concerns um, some of the initial uh, uh, you know um, the initial processes that have been put in place have been to kind of get us aligned so that we can make some of those investments and so developers and and others can make those investments to make those long-term goals of of, of having housing for for, for many across this province. It's a, it's a challenging one. I can tell you there's complexities there that um, when, when you start digging a little deeper, there, there's certainly some complexities that have to be worked out. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to pull our sleeves up and, and engage that way. And um, I know the minister is very passionate about it. Uh, minister Lohr mm-hmm. really does care. If you, if you have a chance to chat with, with, uh, with him, you'll see the, the, you know, that he really does want to make a difference. He wants to see, um, you know, the, this change in our province, not just in HRM or not just in the cities where we're, we know rural areas are struggling as well. It might not be as, as um, you know, out there in your face as uh, in, in, in the cities, but it's there. And, uh, and I'm hearing it in my office and um, it, it is concerning for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, looking back on the legislature session as we wind down here, uh, Trevor, uh, what has it been like for you in terms of simply being the MLA for Richmond? And what do you think are moments of real satisfaction and rewarding moments that you've had uh, over the past couple of months? Uh, We've talked about some of the difficulties and obviously some of the hard issues, uh, but are there any moments uh, that have really stood out for you in terms of special times that you'll take with you as we head into the Christmas season and the new year? I can tell you the, you know, where where my heart really wants to be is in the constituency doing the work here. Um, The legislature is a fascinating place, like I said, and there's lots of time to discuss how things are and how it could be more efficient or more effective and and um, and that side of it. But really, where 
where my heart is 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 trying to work um, to support the residents of, of Richmond County. We, you know, some of the calls that we get. I mean, every call that we get is very personal, and it's very important to the people who are making those phone calls. And 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 I take every one of them very seriously. And one of the things that really like people have just been so appreciative that I do my best to call them back and get back to them as soon as I can. And you know, if it's an issue that I need to see, I'm getting out there visiting. I've I've traveled all around this this uh, riding a number of times now and um, been able to sit in with some uh, community groups and and hear their concerns and hear their opportunities and some of the passion in in what they're saying and look it's it's encouraging and it's motivating to me when you hear about you hear about some of these stories and passion that that, that people have and and in the same boat um, it's very concerning some of the um, the challenges with poverty and with housing and with health care that I'm hearing and and you know, wanting to do my best to 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 support all of those um, those people with needs, um, you know, it, it it's it's a it's a um, it's an interesting place to be. Um, I'm learning a lot on the fly, and uh, and my goal is to be able to help as many people as I can. And I hope people uh, see that when 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 they meet with me or when they talk with me. It's you know, I think there's three there's three outcomes and there's three things that can happen. There are there are issues that people have and you can make a difference with them. And then there's pe- issues that people have and there's not much you can do about it. And, um, and then there's, there's things that people come with you maybe saying they have an issue. I don't really know if it really is an issue, but they really value that you're listening to them. And so uh, all of that being said, we, we've, um, we've got some wonderful people here in the riding and uh, I'm hoping to build capacity with those people and, and, um, and push us all to do the best that we can. So you know, if I can be an advocate for the area and um, and stimulate uh, good discussion and good, you know, um, motivated people to get up and do, you know, do their part, that um, that would be great. Well, that's a good mantra for all of us uh, to have that listening ear for sure. We've covered a lot of ground in a short time, Trevor, as I thought we would. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add about all this just before we wrap up? No, you know, I, I, I just feel like um, we're starting to get into a rhythm. I'm starting to get into a rhythm as a constituency MLA. And certainly I want people to feel comfortable reaching out to me at any time. If um, if they have a concern or they have a question, certainly that's that's my role is to be there to support um, the community and to support the people in it. And, you know, I feel like um, people are now, you know, um, engaging with me more. It doesn't matter if I'm in a grocery store or Tim Hortons. They, they have great, uh, great ideas and love to chat. And certainly I hope people feel comfortable coming up to me. Don't ever, don't ever think you can't No, There's no question that's wrong. There's nothing, there's no stupid question. Um, there might be a silly answer from me, but there's no, you know, it's one of these things that I want people to feel that they can reach out to me and, and that I'm here for them. And, and certainly that I will do my best. And, and, and that's important to me. I have high expectations of myself. Um, and so I want people to, to reach out to me with their problems and with their issues. And also with, some of the nice things they're hearing and the good things that yeah. uh, that they're seeing in the community. And that's one part of the legislature. I will say quickly, we do these member statements and um, it's really rewarding to be able to acknowledge people in the community and in the region and the, and the great work they're doing. So that's another plug. So if you've got stuff going on that you want me to um, give a shout out to, I certainly, uh, that's part of my gig too, is making sure that um, we're, we're acknowledging all the great work that people in our region are doing. Yeah, definitely. And there's a lot of it. And in terms of the questions uh, that you get, a wise man told me many years ago that the only silly question is the one that you don't ask. And I'm glad <laughs> to see you share that same philosophy. Yeah. And and it, just another joke about in the legislature, right? It's called question period, not answer period. I think uh, that ah. was, that, <laughs> that, so there's lots of good questions. And I always try to make fun of the ministers a little bit saying, yeah, oh, you did a good job of answering that question today. But uh, <laughs> no, we're we're you know, it's, it's, it's been, it's been um, very interesting to be in the legislature, that side of it. And, and um, I think, you know, you'll, if you talk to some of the opposition um, members, they would say, you know, our party's been relatively good at answering those questions and, and wanting to make a difference and, and, and engaging with the opposition. So that's, uh, that's positive too. Yeah, that's great. Well, we appreciate you taking some questions from me today here, Trevor. So thank you so much. And uh, great to have you with us uh, for Tell Hill 24-7. And uh, we wish you and Sarah and the kids all the best for Christmas and for 2022 as well. We look forward to working with you in the new year. I'm, I'm happy to be here in any time, Adam. You know that you can reach out.
That's terrific. Trevor Woodrow is the MLA for Richmond, and we've been speaking to him today via Zoom. Stay tuned for more of Tell Ill 24-7 in just a moment. Not only has COVID-19 had a major impact on small businesses in the Strait area, it's also had a big impact on the umbrella lobby group that looks after small businesses in this region. The Strait Area Chamber of Commerce wasn't able to have its fall awards dinner last year. However, they were able to do it this time around on Tuesday evening, November the 30th, at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. So let's take you there right now to take a look at some of the major award winners this year and also to see how the different businesses and the Chamber members themselves are preparing for the Christmas shopping season and doing everything they can to promote local shopping but also keep their customers safe. This is the first time the Strait Chamber and its members have been able to get together for a dinner and awards ceremony in nearly two years, and they were ready to celebrate. <laughs> But even beyond the fiddle music, there was a celebratory air in the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center's Bearhead Conference Room this past Tuesday as pandemic-weary local business owners congratulated each other for reaching the fifth phase of Nova Scotia's reopening strategy. It was nice to get together. It was really awesome to get together. We, you know, everybody's nervous to get out, but I think when you follow the protocols that are set by the provincial government, you can hold an event and everybody can be safe and celebrate such wonderful accomplishments as we have with the businesses in the straight area. In addition to handing out awards and commiserating over various aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, Chamber of Commerce executives took the opportunity to remind local business owners of the new Step Up for Local campaign that's hoping to bring straight area customers into more local stores and other enterprises this coming holiday season. So the straight area chamber is using shop local funding received through the federal government's investment of up to 2.7 million across Atlantic Canada. Locally, the chamber will use the funds to increase awareness across multiple media platforms to develop community-based video assets and to provide incentives to residents to step up and support local businesses. We're also running a few promotions through social media, so um, basically buying gift cards to put the dollars back in the hands of our local businesses and encourage people to continue to shop locally. Along with the Step Up for Local campaign and the Chamber's traditional 12 Draws of Christmas promotion, there's some optimism in the room considering how far business in the province has come forward since the days of the spring lockdown and even since last Christmas. The Chamber is still doing its part to help small businesses at this stage of the pandemic. As a matter of fact, the Chamber is working with the provincial government to secure rapid testing kits for its local businesses. But overall, with Phase 5 of the Nova Scotia reopening strategy well into effect, Chamber members are feeling happy just to be able to welcome customers back as the holiday rush continues. Businesses are optimistically looking forward. I think we're lucky in this region that, uh, you know, the numbers are low in the province and, you know, they're, we're doing our best to keep it that way and people, you know, trying to support local. Of course, the hopefulness is tempered with some concern given the recent arrival of COVID-19's Omicron variant in Canada, as well as continued community spread for the Delta variant in different parts of Nova Scotia. However, the Strait Area Chamber of Commerce is vowing to soldier on. Well, we hear stories of new variants and everybody's probably a little bit concerned and hoping that we at least get through the holiday season before um, anything was to go backwards again, but, but again... We have to be optimistic and fingers crossed that it, it won't uh, affect us too severely because businesses really do need to be able to plan and uh, move forward with some confidence. In the meantime, having already spent months adjusting to masking requirements and to the changes in those masking requirements, straight area businesses appear to be adjusting well to the proof of vaccination era, according to straight chamber executives Misty McDonald and Susan Fox. Oh, 100%. Yeah, no, we're just, you, you do what you can to follow the measures that are needed to keep everybody safe. And I think everybody's in agreement that we have to do that in order to move forward. It's the safest way and the best way to, you know, move in the right direction. I would say that the um, comments from businesses would be that um, they would really like to, they're asking us, are you checking for vaccination? Because they want to feel safe going to our events. So it's actually becoming 
um, versus us having to impose something, which everybody agrees to, so there's no imposition. They're actually looking for that. So, exactly. Yeah, so I, th I would say just given by that signal, people are very comfortable um, with the process and, and happy that it's being enforced. In the meantime, there was a lot to celebrate on this night at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center. Accepting the Immigrant Entrepreneur of the Year Award on behalf of Port Hawkesbury's A1 Pizza was George Yusuf. The Chamber's 2021 Export Achievement Award went to Cabot Gypsum, based in Point Tupper. John Powers of Breton Petroleum was named the Outstanding Customer Service Award winner for 2021. And the winners for Rising Star New Business Award were La Brie Cafe Restaurant and Bar in Shettacamp. Now, you may be noticing a common thread to these images from the winner's circle, and not just Chamber of Commerce President Dean Hart on the left. On the right is Adam Rogers. He's the strategic advisor to the Friends United Center in Cleveland, and that particular complex has provided some special artwork for the winners of this Chamber event. We had an added special surprise, even to us. Yesterday, Ralph Bowman donated some artwork to all the award winners so that was totally unexpected and and very exciting for the award recipients. Also taking home artwork and awards from the fall chamber dinner were the owners of the Inverary Resort in Bedeck, this year's inductees into the chamber's Club 50. Several local businesses received Club 25 awards for their longevity in the Strait region. They included Martin Marietta Materials of Alts Cove, the Nova Scotia Community College's Strait Area Campus in Port Hawkesbury, Highland Cellular's operations in Port Hawkesbury, and a long-running event with many venues within the Strait Area and around Cape Breton Island, the Celtic Colors International Festival, represented here by the festival's executive director, Mike McSween. That particular award, combined with the Excellence in Business Award for Judix Celtic Music Interpretive Center, gave the Chamber the opportunity to add a traditional Cape Breton flair to the evening. We added on, um, with the help of Celtic Colors, a little extra special performance in the way of Andrea Beaton and Mac Morin. And so um, you can't help but get excited <laughs> when you can yes, exactly. tap your feet and, and feel like you're um, able to enjoy live music again. So I think even that just brought so much to the atmosphere. <laughs> And so, with the fiddle tunes flying and some cautious optimism for the Christmas shopping season, straight area business owners shared their own pandemic-era victories and offered a little bit of hope for the days and weeks to come. In Port Hawkesbury, for Telil 24-7, I'm Adam Cook. And that wraps up this week's edition of Telil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my feature interview guest this week, MLA Trevor Boudreau, and many thanks as well to the others I interviewed for our coverage this week, Sean Sampson, Arlene Richardson, Annette Boudreau, Susan Fox, and Misty McDonald. If you have any comments about what you've seen or heard over the past 45 minutes, or you'd simply like to make some suggestions for future interviews of Tell Ill 24-7, I'd love to hear from you. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also reach out to Tell Ill Community Television with your ideas and your comments. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is info at telil.tv. Don't forget to follow Telil Community Television on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And our YouTube channel has every single episode of Telil 24-7, including this one, as well as our sister programs Roundtable and Note Cote. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you very much for tuning in to Telil 24-7. I'll see you next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.